while it was going through the press, he married Donna Catalina de Palacio Salazar y Vesmediano, a lady of Esquivius near Madrid, and apparently a friend of the family, who brought the drama had by this time outgrown marketplace stages and strolling companies, and with his old love for it he naturally turned to it for a congenial employment. In about three years he wrote twenty or thirty plays, which he tells us were performed without any throwing of cucumbers or other missiles, and ran their course without any hisses, outcries. In other words, his plays were not bad enough to be hissed off the stage, but not good enough to hold their own upon it. Only two of them have been preserved, but as they happen to be two of the seven or eight he mentions with complacency, we may assume they are favorable specimens, and no one who reads the new man, whatever merits they may have, whatever occasional they may show, they are, as regards construction, incurably clumsy. How completely they failed is manifest from the fact that with all his sanguine temperament and indomitable perseverance, he was unable to maintain the struggle to gain a livelihood as a dramatist for more than when Locke began to write for the stage is uncertain, but it was certainly after servants went to Seville. Among the Nuvas documentus printed by Senor Essentio e Toldo is one dated 1592, and curiously characteristic of servants. It is in agreement with one Rodrigo Osorio, a manager, who was to accept six comedies at fifty ducats about six of a piece not to be paid in any case unless the test does not seem to have been ever applied. Perhaps it was sufficiently apparent to Rodrigo Osorio that the comedies were not among the best that had ever been represented. Among the correspondence of servants there might have been found, no doubt, more than one letter like that we see in the rake's progress. Sir, I have read your play, and it will not Jason too, when his composition won the first prize, three silver spoons. The year before this he had been appointed a collector of revenues for the kingdom of Granada. In order to remit the money he had collected more conveniently to the treasury, he entrusted it to a merchant, who failed and absconded. And as the bankrupt's assets were insufficient to cover the, the balance against him, however, was a small one, about twenty six and on giving security for it he was released at the end of the year. It was as he journeyed from town to town collecting the king's taxes that he noted down those bits of inn and wayside life and character that abounded in the pages of Dunt. Nay, it may well be that on those journeys into remote regions he came across now and then a specimen of the pauper gentleman with his lean hack and his greyhound and his books of chivalry. But it was in Seville that he found out his true vocation though he himself would not by any means have admitted it to be so. It was there, in Triana, that he was first tempted to try his hand at drawing from life, and first brought his humour into play in the exquisite little sketch of Rinconet y Cortadillo. The After his imprisonment, all trace of servants in his official capacity disappears, from which it may be inferred that he was not reinstated. That he was still in Seville in November 1598 appears from a satirical sonnet of his on the elaborate catafalque erected to testify the grief of the city at the death of Philip I. But from this up to the words in the preface to the first part of Don Quixote are generally held to be conclusive that he conceived the idea of the book and wrote the beginning of it at least in a prison, and that he may have. There is a tradition that servants read some portions of his work to a select audience at the Duke of Bijar's, which may have helped to make the book known. But the obvious conclusion is that the first part of the printing was finished in December, and the book came out with the new year, 1605. It is often said that Don Quixote was at first received coldly. The facts show just the contrary. No sooner was it in the hands of the public than preparations were made to issue pirated editions at Lisbon and Valencia, and to bring out a second edition with the additional copyrights for Aragon and Portugal. No doubt it was received with something more than coldness by certain sections of the community. Men of wit, taste, and discrimination among the aristocracy gave it a hearty welcome, but the aristocracy in general were not likely to relish a book that turned their favorite reading into ridicule and the dramatists who gathered round Lope as their leader regarded servants as their common enemy, 
and it is plain that he was equally obnoxious to the other clique, the cultipotes who had gone Gora for their chief. Navarit, who knew nothing of the letter above mentioned, tries hard to show that the relations between servants and Lope were of a very friendly sort, as indeed they were until Don Quixote was servants indeed, to the last generously, and manfully declared his admiration of Lope's powers, his unfailing invention, and his marvellous fertility. But in 1601 Valladolid was made the seat of the court, and at the beginning of 1603 servants had been summoned thither in connection with the balance due by him to the treasury, which was... He remained at Valladolid, apparently supporting himself by agencies and scrivener's work of some sort, probably drafting petitions and drawing up statements of claims to be presented. So, at least, we gather from the depositions taken on the occasion of the death of a gentleman, the victim of a street brawl, who had been carried into the house in which he lived. In these he himself is described as a man who wrote and transacted business, and it appears that his household then consisted of his wife, the natural daughter Isabel de Savre already Meanwhile, Don Quixote had been growing in favor, and its author's name was now known beyond the Pyrenees. In 1607, an edition was printed at Brussels. Robles, the Madrid publisher, found it necessary to meet the demand by a third edition, the seventh in all, in 1608. The popularity of the book in Italy was such that a Milan bookseller was led to bring out an edition in 1610 and another was called for in Brussels in 1611. It might naturally have been expected that, with such proofs before him that he had hit the taste of the public, servants would have at once set about redeeming his rather vague promise of a second volume. But, to all appearance, nothing was farther from his thoughts. He had still by him one or two short tales of the same vintage as those he had inserted in Don Quixote, and instead of continuing the adventures of Don Quixote, he set to work to write. The novels were published in the summer of 1613, with a dedication to the Conde Limos, the Maecenas of the day, and with one of those chatty confidential prefaces servants was. In this, eight years and a half after the first part of Don Quixote had appeared, we get the first hint of a forthcoming second part. You shall see shortly, he says the further exploits of Don Quixote and Hugh Moore's of Sancho Panza. His idea of shortly was a somewhat elastic one for, but more than poems or pastorals or novels, it was his dramatic ambition that engrossed his thoughts. The same indomitable spirit that kept him from despair in the Bagnias of Algiers, and prompted him to attempt the escape of himself and his comrades again and again, made him persevere in spite the temperament of servants was essentially sanguine. The portrait he draws in the preface to the novels, with the aquiline features, chestnut hair, smooth untroubled forehead, and bright cheerful eyes, is the very portrait. Nothing that the managers might say could persuade him that the merits of his plays would not be recognized at last if they were only given a fair chance. The old soldier of the Spanish Salamis was bent on being the ace chalice of Spain. He was to found a great national drama, based on the true principles of art, that was to be the envy of all nations. He was to drive from the stage the silly childish play. All this he was to do, could he once get a hearing. There was the initial difficulty. He shows plainly enough, too, that Don Quixote and the demolition of the Chivalry romances was not the work that lay next his heart. He was, indeed, as he says himself in his preface, more a stepfather than a father to Don Quixote. Never was great work so neglected by its author, that it was written carelessly, hastily, and by fits and starts, was not always his fault, but it seems clear he never read what he sent to the press. He knew how the printers had blundered, but he never took the trouble to correct them when the third edition was in progress, as a man who really cared for the child of his brain would have done. He appears to have regarded the book as little more than a mere libro di entretenimi into an amusing book, a thing, as he says in the V age, to divert the melancholy moody heart at any time. It would have been strange indeed if he had not been proud of the most humorous creation in all fiction. He was proud, too, 
of the popularity and success of the book, and beyond measure delightful is the navy with which he shows his pride in a dozen passages in the second part. But it was not the success he coveted. In all probability he would have given all the success of Don Quixote, nay, would have seen every copy of Don Quixote burned in the Plaza Mayor, for one such success as Lope de Vigo, and so he went on, dawdling over Don Quixote, adding a chapter now and again, and putting it aside to turn to Persaz and Sigismunda, which, as we know, at sixty-eight he was as full of life and hope and plans for the future as a boy of eighteen. Nemesis was coming, however. He had got as far as chapter licks, which at his leisurely pace, he could hardly have reached before October or November 1614, when there was put into his hand a small... Had Avalanida, in fact, been content with merely bringing out a continuation to Don Quixote, servants would have had no reasonable grievance. His own intentions were expressed in the very vaguest language at the end of the book. Nay, in his last words, force all trocanter conmiglier pletro, he seems... In fact, servants had no case, or a very bad one, as far as the mere continuation was concerned. But Avalanida chose to write a preface to it, full of such coarse personal abuse as only an ill-conditioned man could pour out. He taunts servants with being old, with having lost his hand, with having been in prison, with being poor, with being friendless, accuses him of envy of Lope's success, Avalanida's reason for this personal attack is obvious enough. Whoever he may have been, it is clear that he was one of the dramatists of Lope's school, for he has the impudence to charge servants with attacking him as well as Lope in his criticism on the... His identification has exercised the best critics and baffled all the ingenuity and research that has been brought to bear on it. Navarid and Tickner both inclined to the belief that servants knew who he was but I must say I think the anger he shows suggests an invisible assailant. It is like the irritation of a man. Servants from certain solecisms of language pronounces him to be an Aragonese, and Pelliser, an Aragonese himself, supports this view and believes him, moreover, to have any merit Avalanida has is reflected from servants, and he is too dull to reflect much. Dull and dirty will always be, I imagine, the verdict of the vast majority of unprejudiced readers. He is, at best, a poor plagiarist. All he can do is to follow slavishly the lead given him by servants. His only humor lies in making Don Quixote take it. But whatever Avalanida and his book may be, we must not forget the debt we owe them. But for them, there can be no doubt, Don Quixote would have come to us a mere torso instead of a complete work. Even if servants had finished the volume he had in hand, most assuredly he would have left off with a promise of a third part, giving the further adventures of Don Quixote and humours of San Cupan. It is plain that he had at one time an intention of dealing with the pastoral romances as he had dealt with the books of chivalry, and but for Avalanida he would have tried to carry it out. But it is more likely that, with his plans and projects and hopefulness, the volume would have remained unfinished till his death, and that we should have never made the acquaintance of the Duke and Duchess, or from the moment the book came into his hands he seems to have been haunted by the fear that there might be more Avalanidas in the field, and putting everything else aside, he set himself to finish off his task. The conclusion is no doubt a hasty and in some places clumsy piece of work, and the frequent repetition of the scolding administered to Avalanida becomes in the end rather wearisome but it is at any rate. The new volume was ready for the press in February, but was not printed till the very end of 1615, and during the interval servants put together the comedies and interludes he had written within the last. It is needless to say they were put forward by servants in all good faith and full confidence in their merits. The reader, however, was not to suppose they were his last word or final effort in the drama, for he had in hand a comedy called Engano a Los Ojos, about which, if he mistook not, there would of this dramatic masterpiece the world has no opportunity of judging. His health had been failing for some time, and he died, apparently of dropsy. On the 23rd, he died as he had lived, 
accepting his lot bravely and cheerfully. Was it an unhappy life, that of servants? His biographers all tell us that it was, but I must say I doubt it. It was a hard life, a life of poverty, of incessant struggle, of toil ill-paid, of disappointment, but servants carried within himself the antidote to all these evils. His was not one of those light natures that rise above adversity merely by virtue of their own buoyancy. It was in the fortitude of a high spirit that he was proof against it. It is impossible to conceive servants giving way to despondency or prostrated by dejection. As for poverty, it was with him a thing to be laughed over, and the only sigh he ever allows to escape him is when he says, Happy he to whom heaven has given a piece of bread for which he is not he who could take servant's distresses together with his apparatus for enduring them would not make so bad a bargain, perhaps, as far as happiness in life is concerned. Of his burial place nothing is known except that he was buried, in accordance with his will, in the neighboring convent of Trinitarian nuns, of which it is supposed his daughter, Isabel de Sa but whether the remains of servants were included in the removal or not no one knows and the clue to their resting place is now lost beyond all hope. This furnishes perhaps the least defensible of the items in the charge of neglect brought against his contemporaries. In some of the others there is a good deal of exaggeration. To listen to most of his biographers, one would suppose that all Spain was in league not only against the man but against his memory, or at least that it was insensible to his merits, and left to talk of his hard life and unworthy employments in Andalusia is absurd. What had he done to distinguish him from thousands of other struggling men earning a precarious livelihood? True, he was a gallant soldier, who had been wounded and had undergone captivity. He had written a mediocre specimen of an insipid class of Romans, and some plays which manifestly did not comply with the primary condition of pleasing. Were the playgoers to patronize plays, no doubt it was received coldly by some, but if a man writes a book in ridicule of periwigs, he must make his account with being coldly received by the periwig wearers and hated by the whole tribe of... If servants had the chivalry romance readers, the sentimentalists, the dramatists, and the poets of the period all against him, it was because Don Quixote was what it was. And it, it did the best it could. It read his book and liked it and bought it, and encouraged the bookseller to pay him well for others. It has been also made a reproach to Spain that she has erected no monument to the man she is proudest of, no monument, that is to say, of him. For the bronze statue in the little garden, but what need has servants of such weak witness of his name? Or what could a monument do in his case except testify to the self-glorification of those who had put it up? Si monumentum chorus, the nearest bookseller's shop, will show what bathos there would be in a monument to the author of Don Quixote. Don Quixote, nine editions of the first part of Don Quixote had already appeared. So large a number naturally supplied the demand for some time, but by 1634 it appears to have been exhausted. And from that time down to the present day the stream of editions has continued. The translations show still more clearly in what request the book has been from the very outset. In seven years from the completion of the work it had been translated into the four leading languages of Europe, except the Bible, in fact, no book has been so widely diffused as Don Quixote. The Imitatio Christi may have been translated into as many different languages. Still more remarkable is the character of this wide diffusion. Don Quixote has been thoroughly naturalized among people whose ideas about knight errantry if they had any at all, were of the vaguest, who had never seen or heard of a book of chivalry. Another curious fact is that this, the most cosmopolitan book in the world, is one of the most intensely national. Man in Lescott is not more thoroughly French, Tom Jones not more English, Rob Roy not more Scotch, than Don Quixote is Spanish in character and ideas in sentiment, in lo- What then? is the secret of this unparalleled popularity, increasing year by year for well-nigh three centuries. One explanation, no doubt, is that of, there is something in it for every sort of reader, young or old, sage or simple, high or low. 
as servants himself says with a touch of pride it is thumbed and read and got by heart by people of all sorts the children turn its leaves the young people read it the grown men understand it was the attack upon the sheep the battle with the wine skins mambrino's helmet the balsam of Freerabress, don quixote knocked over by the sails of the windmill it is plain that don quixote was generally regarded at first and indeed in spain for a long time as little more than a queer droll book full of laughable incidents and absurd situations all the editions printed in spain from sixteen thirty seven to seventeen seventy one when the famous printer abara took it up were mere trade editions badly and carelessly printed to england belongs the credit of having been the first country to recognize the right of don quixote to better treatment than this the london edition of seventeen thirty eight commonly called lord carteret's from having been suggested by him was not a mere edition de luxe it produced a quixote then becoming form as regards paper and type and embellished with plates which if not particularly happy as illustrations were at least well intentioned and well the zeal of publishers editors and annotators brought about a remarkable change of sentiment with regard to don quixote a vast number of its admirers began to grow ashamed it became almost a crime to treat it as a humorous book the humor was not entirely denied but according to the new view it was rated as an altogether secondary quality a mere accessory nothing more than the stalking horse on all were agreed however that the object he aimed at was not the books of chivalry he said emphatically in the preface to the first part and in the last sentence of the second that he had no other object in view than to discredit these books and this to advanced criticism one theory was that the book was a kind of allegory setting forth the eternal struggle between the ideal and the real between the spirit of poetry and the spirit of prose and perhaps something of the antagonism no doubt is to be found in don quixote because it is to be found everywhere in life and servants drew from life it is difficult to imagine a community in which the never-ceasing game of cross-purposes between sancho panza and don quixote would not be recognized as true to nature in the stone age among the lake dwellers among the cave men there were don quixotes and sancho panzas there must have been the troglodyte who never could see the facts before his eyes but to suppose servants deliberately setting himself to expound any such idea in two stout quarto volumes is to suppose something not only very unlike the age in which he lived but altogether the extraordinary influence of the romances of chivalry in his day is quite enough to account for the genesis of the book some idea of the prodigious development of this branch of literature in the sixteenth century may be obtained from the scrutiny of chapter via if the reader bears in mind that only a portion of the roman as to its effect upon the nation there is abundant evidence from the time when the amatuses and palmerins began to grow popular down to the very end of the century there is a steady stream of invective from men whose character and position lend weight to their ridicule was the only be some to sweep away that dust that this was the task servants set himself and that he had ample provocation to urge him to it will be sufficiently clear to those who look into the evidence as it will be also that it was not of all the absurdities that thanks to poetry will be repeated to the end of time there is no greater one than saying that servants smiled spain's chivalry away in the spain's chivalry had been dead for more than a century its work was done when granada fell and as chivalry was essentially republican in its nature it could not live under the rule that ferdinand substituted for the free institutions of media what he did smile away was not chivalry but a degrading mockery of it the true nature of the right arm and the bright array before which according to the pope de, the world gave ground and which servant a single laugh demolished may be gathered from there were seen so many cavaliers prancing and curvetting before the windows of their mistresses that a stranger would have imagined the whole nation to have been nothing less than a race of knight-errants but after the world became a little acquainted with that notable history the man that was seen in that once celebrated drapery was pointed at as a don quixote 
and found himself the jest of high and, and i verily believe that to this and this only we owe that dampness and poverty of spirit which has run through all our councils for a century past so little agreeable to those noble it would be so if its moral were that in this world true enthusiasm naturally leads to ridicule and discomfiture but it preaches nothing of the sort its moral so far as it can be said to have one is that the spurious enthusiasm that is born of vanity and self-conceit that is made in it to those who cannot distinguish between the one kind and the other no doubt don quixote is a sad book no doubt to some minds it is very sad that a man who had just uttered so beautiful a sentence a very slight examination of the structure of don quixote will suffice to show that servants had no deep design or elaborate plan in his mind when he began the book when he wrote those lines in which with a few strokes of a great master he sets before us the pauper gentleman he had no idea of the goal to which his imagination was leading him there can be little doubt that all he contemplated was a short tale to range with those he had already written a tale setting forth the ludicrous results that might be expected to follow the attempt of a crazy gen it is plain for one thing that sancho panza did not enter into the original scheme for had servants thought of him he certainly would not have omitted him in his hero's outfit which he obviously meant him we owe to the landlord's chance remark in chapter aya that knights seldom travelled without squires to try to think of a don quixote without sancho panza is like trying to think of a one-bladed pair of scissors the story was written at first like the others without any division and without the intervention of sidhamit benengeli and it seems not unlikely that servants had some intention of bringing it was probably the ransacking of the don's library and the discussion on the books of chivalry that first suggested it to him that his idea was capable of development what if instead of a mere string of farcical misadventures he were to make his tale a burlesque of one of these books caricaturing their style incidents and spirit in working out the new ideas he soon found the value of sancho panza indeed the keynote not only to sancho's part but to the whole book is struck in the first words sancho utters when he announces his intention of taking his ass with him about the ass we are told don quixote hesitated a little trying whether he could call to mind any knight errant taking with him an esquire mounted on his back but no instance this is sancho's mission throughout the book he is an unconscious mephistophels always unwittingly making mockery of his master's aspirations always exposing the fact by the time servants had got his volume of novels off his hands and summoned up resolution enough to set about the second part in earnest the case was very much altered don quixote and sancho panza had not merely found favor but had already become what they have never since ceased to be veritable entities to the popular imagination there was no occasion for him now to interpolate extraneous matter nay his readers told him plainly that what they wanted of him was more don quixote and more sancho panza to himself too his creations had become realities and he had become proud of them especially of sanko he began the second part therefore under very different conditions and the difference makes itself manifest at once even in translation the style will be seen to be far easier more flowing more natural and more like that of a man sure of himself and of his audience don quixote and sanko undergo a change also in the first part don quixote has no character or individuality whatever he is nothing more than a crazy representative of the sentiments of the chivalry romances in all that he says and does he is simply repeating the lesson he has learned from his books and therefore it is absurd to speak of him in the gushing strain of the sentimental critics when they delayed upon it was the business of a knight errant to right wrongs redress injuries and succor the distressed and this as a matter of course he makes his business when he takes of all byron's melodious nonsense about don quixote the most nonsensical statement is that tis his virtue makes him mad the exact opposite is the truth it is his mad in the second part 
servants repeatedly reminds the reader as if it was a point upon which he was anxious there should be no mistake that his hero's madness is strictly confined to 